This program is brought to you by Emory University. Good morning, everyone. Welcome to Cardiovascular Grand Rounds. Uh, this morning we have someone well known to most of you, and that's Dr. Tanvir Rabb. Dr. Rabb's an associate professor in the Division of Cardiology, and as many of you know, one of our interventional cardiologists. Um, Tanvir is uh, involved on many of the steering committees and writing committees for uh, ACC, etc., and today he's going to talk to us about uh, an area of evolving interest and uh, for all of us and talk about current inter interventions for the left main. He's going to tell us why it's called the left main, too, right? instead of just the left. Thank you, Bob. I haven't, I haven't figured that out yet. Um, so I think I was going back and looking at it, but every three, or three years or so, I've given a talk on this subject. And uh, it is of interest because it's one of those areas that was a taboo to go after with interventional cardiology, interventional techniques. So um, I'll go and start by defining um, what is significant left main coronary stenosis. This is a what visually on angiogram you see as more than 50% narrowing, which found in 5 to 7% of cases when they go coronary angiography. Having said that, uh, us being a tertiary or quaternary care center, if we see a proportionally larger number of patients being referred to us from elsewhere for, for intervention. Uh, most patients are symptomatic and at high risk of cardiovascular events, since occlusion of this vessel comprises flow to at least 75% of the myocardium. An untreated left main stenosis has a more than 20% mortality at one year and 50% at three years. So there's a bit of history that goes back with us. Um, Andreas Grunzig actually performed the first left main balloon PTC in 1978. He had two cases out of the 50 or so he reported in a seminal paper in the New England Journal of Medicine in 1979. So this was the um, picture uh, which uh, Dr. King has actually. So this was a left main stenosis and he dilated this with a balloon angioplasty, and this was his angiographic result, which many would say is satisfactory. However, Grunzig wrote in this paper uh, in July 1979 that he said two points must be made. We have not been too successful in dilating stenotic main stems of left coronary arteries. It has been difficult to estimate the extent of the disease in this area, which as you know now, we have been able to assess by intravascular imaging techniques and to estimate the presence of concomitant spasm, which of course, as you know, we've been more or less able to conquer with the use of coronary stents. We feel that these factors contributed to the death of one patient. One of his two patients died like two months after the procedure, sort of gave up on this procedure at that time. And he says all the procedures are relatively simple because of access and location. Uh, it requires special experience. Moreover, the potential complications are both serious and sudden. So that is mandatory that a competent surgeon be available for emergency cabbage if necessary. The procedure should not be performed in hospitals lacking this facility. And most of this is true. We don't feel that, that the smaller centers who do, say, less than 50 PCR should really have operators doing these kind of procedures. For example, in China, with the largest center, Fu Wai, which, is, which does 15,000 uh, PCIs a year, uh, the, the operator, minimum operator experience is about 30 left main PCIs per year. So just to give you an idea. So 40 years later, and over the past decade, we've had the results of four important trials. I'm going to talk about trials, not registries, not, 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 uh, uh, not evolution of, of results from smaller centers over a 10-year period, but actual trials. And the four important trials that we, we must think about in this area is the original syntax left main trial, which is a synergy between percutaneous intervention, taxes, and cardiac surgery, five-year outcomes of which were reported with the first generation st uh, drug stents in 2014, and the more recent one, the pre-combat, uh, which is bypass surgery versus angioplasty with serolimus, the first generation uh, stent in patients with left main coronary disease reported in 2015. Last year, two important trials came out. One was the XL, which we are a participant in, which is Everlimits, Luting, Stents, or Bypass Surgery, Left Main, and the Noble Study, which is out of Europe, which is percutaneous coronary angioplasty versus cabbage in the treatment of unprotected left main stenosis. So these are the important current relevant trials for our decision-making in how we perceive left main coronary artery intervention. The, 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 the denominator in all these trials is the syntax score. Each one of these trials utilized a syntax score, which is a unique angiographic grading tool 
to score the complexity of coronary artery disease based on coronary angiography. It's not a clinical score. Syntax 2, which is a clinical score added to it, was not used as part of these trials. The score is used to choose optimal revascularization strategy, PCI or cabbage, as widely used as inclusion criteria in most PCI versus cabbage revascularization trials. And this is done by using an online, scoring is done by an online calculator from syntoxscore.com. So this is what it looks like. You, you have to see the dominance of the system, the left dominance, the right dominance, and the segments based on the AHA classification that you, that you, that you uh, indicate where your lesion might be. And then you go through a series of questions, which is total occlusion, yes or no, trafication, yes or no, bifurcation, so on, aorta lesion, severe tortuosity, leave lesion length, calcification, thrombus presence, to add to your scoring system. Based on this, you can get several tertials. So the low syntax score in left mains are those, those that are predominantly isolated left main, or isolated left main with one vessel disease. So that, that group is generally scored between 0 to 22. Intermediate syntax is one with left main plus two vessel disease. But anything more than that, left main plus three vessel disease with increased disease complexity is actually high syntax score, more than 33. So these are three tertials of patients, and that's how they fall in the, in the syntax left main trial at five years, using first-generation drug looting stents. So at five years, what we found out was that the, 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 um, the event-free rate was very similar in the cabbage and PCI arm, with, with the rates of revascularization were similar in both cabbage and PCI. However, in the cabbage group, there's a slightly higher incidence of death and stroke. In the intermediate score group, which is 22, 32, again, the cumulative event rates are very, very similar, but the rates of death in the cabbage arm was slightly higher, the strokes are still slightly higher, the revascularization rates now in the PCI arm was, was larger. And when you go to the higher scores, the PCI uh, arm did not do so well. The event rates were higher with a group that went PCI versus cabbage, rates of revascularization were higher, deaths rates were higher and, and uh, strokes rates were essentially unchanged. So what it tells you that with increased disease complexity, cabbage continues to be the king in this situation. Now, contemporary left main versus cabbage trials, I put up this, 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 this table, with first generation being syntax left main, and second generation being pre-combat two, which was second generation drug stents, XL and noble trials. The most important thing that came out of these trials was that at, at uh, 30 days in the XL group, dead stroke or MI, uh, in the PCI arm was 4.9%, the cabbage arm 7.9%, and in the noble trial, again, the death rates are very low, PCI is 0.34%, cabbage 1.2%. However, when you went out to three years in the, in the, in the XL arm, there was equipoise between PCI and cabbage, and PCI was felt to be non-inferior. So we're talking about the XL trial. In the Nobel trial, which is done mostly in Europe, at five years, the PCI arm, higher incidence of death and my stroke, was the cabbage arm. And they felt that the PCI was inferior due to increased amounts of MI and stroke rates. Not necessarily in the same vessel, uh, or corporate lesion being the same vessel, but due to increased rates of MI and stroke. And so some discussion that the quality of the stents used was somewhat inferior to the XL, everlimited stent in the XL group. Based on this, one thing that came out of this was a syntax score, which was very predictive in the original syntax left main trial. At three years, patients with low to intermediate scores had equipoise between PCI and cabbage. It was not lower. But in Noble, at five years, patients with low syntax scores had worse outcomes was with PCI than cabbage. So the score itself in this particular set of patients with a second generation drug resistance was not predictive of outcomes. What about target lesion revascularization? In the original syntax uh, left main trial, which used the first generation drug looting stents, five year target lesion revascularization was, was 23%. But the important fine print from, from these trials is that in the XL trial, in the target lesion revascularization in the PCI arm was 12.6%, and again, Noble was 12%. So it have the newer generation drug looting stents have the target lesion revascularization rate. So, where uh, does restenosis occur? And the ostium of shaft is very low. If you put a stent in, the target lesion revascularization is 4.5%, and that comes from a large registry known as the Delta Registry out of Europe. But at the distal left main bifurcation, particularly the circumflex ostium, the target lesion revascularization rate is less than 13%. 
And a lot of our focus now is to, make sure, to try to ameliorate, reduce the amount of TLR in this particular zone. So, in, concluding from this trial, uh, Excel PCI is non-inferior cavity at three years in patients with syntax less than 32. Noble PCI is inferior to cavity five years in patients with lower syntax scores. Syntax scores do not predict outcomes. For PCI to have equipoise with cabbage, we need to await the Excel five-year results, which is another two years from now. Generally, there's very low 30-day and long-term mortality, and the interventional procedure itself is safe. Now, this meta-analysis just came out last week in JAMA Cardiology, and they looked at over 4,000 patients, all four trials, and they found that no significant difference in two treatment strategies at five years. The PCI arm was 18.3 percent, the cabbage arm at 16.9 percent. What is also noted in this plot was in syntax scores low to intermediate, there was equipoise between cabbage and PCI. But the TLR, TLR rates again favored revascularization, uh, repeat revascularization favored cabbage but not PCI, but it did not increase mortality rate. So mortality rates not increase, TLR is increasing in the PCI arm, but in the lower score, there's equipoise between the two strategies. Conclusions. Le left main PCI with DS is a safe procedure for low and intermediate syntax scores. Outcomes are non inferior cabbage. Clinical equipoise, again, is with cabbage rates, the five year Excel trial results, and TLR rates are low with second generation drug gluten stents uh, and stenting techniques, but remain an issue. So, what, are the, what do the guidelines say? Uh, and so, for left main disease, you should always have a heart team approach. So we'll go to the European guidelines and the ACC guidelines. So in the low syntax scores, 0 to 22, European Society of Cardiology gives it class 1 evidence, class 1 indication, level of evidence B. And, but the ACCHA gives it a class 2 A indication. For, 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 for cabbage, again, it's a class 1 indication. Again, for ACHA, cabbage is a class 1 indication. For intermediate scores, 23 to 32, the European Society of Cardiology gives a 2A indication, ACHA gives it a 2B indication, and for both of them, the cabbage is a class 1 indication. And class 3, of course, cabbage is a class 1 indication. For both the European Society of Cardiology and American College of Cardiology and American Heart Association, PCI is a class 3 indication, exceptions being cabbage ineligible, ineligible patients with STS score greater than 4, advanced age, end stage lung renal hepatic disease, and complex CAD with low EF and mechanical circuitry support. So cabbage has a class one indication, all, all groups, and the Europeans have made in low scores a class one indication, uh, but, the, but the US has a class two indication. In the intermediate scores, the Europeans have a class two indication, we have a class two B indication. And there was hope after the Excel trial that perhaps we will move up in the same direction as the Europeans have. Now, this does not include, the guidelines do not include emergency left main PCI in patients with acute myocardial infarction with cardiogenic shock, post-op, non-cabbage, and cabbage failure. So criteria for left main intervention is angiographic diameter stenosis equal to or greater than 70%, or IVUS OCT, left main, minimal luminal area less than 6 millimeters square, or FFR equal to or less than 0 0.80. So the sites of left main disease are ostium, shaft, and distal bifurcation. And 80% of left main lesions involve the distal bifurcation. What is the left main the complex high-risk intervention procedures? And what is the mortality risk for these procedures? If you have elective PCI, pretty from Excel and Noble, the risk of doing the procedure itself is about 1.1%. If you have a high-risk PCI with LV support, the mortality rate is less than 9%, and this comes from the large registries like the Impella, uh, Europella, and Global CVAD registries. High risk without support, mortality risk is 24%. If you have cardiogenic shock, the risk of the procedure is extremely high, 50 to 80%. So elective, relatively stable patient, the risk of the procedure is low. When is LV support required, uh, or high-risk percutaneous LVAD, generally using Impella, so you have left main PCI and STEMI with cardiogenic shock or arrest. If your EF is less than 35%, you have a large occluded RC in the setting of left main stenosis, or you utilize rotational atherectomy with a depressed LV EF. These are the general broad, broad areas. So we, we did not have best techniques for left main practice. Everyone in the world was having their own little technique, 
and multiple different techniques published from different operators, China, France, Italy, South Korea, without common agreement. So there was thought that we should have sort of a consensus document, not validated by any group, but a consensus document was needed for best techniques based on clinical trials, not what, any, what anyone wanted to do, but what was done through trials. And we decided to produce a document with a representation from the European Bifurcation Club and the Asian Bifurcation Club. So this was published in uh, May this year in Jack Interventions, Current Interventional Left Main Bifurcation. Dr. Sheban is from Italy, has just published a 10-year outcomes of left main intervention. Dr. Luard is really a, a, a master class operator who was very involved in techniques of bifurcation and, le and putting left main disease. Fadi was a fellow with them at that time who helped uh, uh, write this manuscript. Dr. Zhang and Dr. Chen are operators out of China who have done a lot of work in the left main territory. So how do you classify left main bifurcation? So you do that on the basis of the side branch. If the side branch lesion is less than 70%, or the lesion length is less than 10%, it becomes a simple lesion, okay? Minimal disease side branch. If the side branch lesion is more than 70%, or the lesion length is greater than 10%, it becomes a complex lesion. And things that add to the complexity include moderate to severe calcification, multiple lesions, a bifurcation angle less than 45, main vessel referent vessel diameter less than 2.5 meters, or a small left main, thrombus containing lesion, and main ve uh, vessel lesion length more than 25 millimeters. So lesion classification approaches to left main PCR are determined by the side branch. We therefore produce this algorithm to say how we should approach uh, these kind of patients. For a simple lesion with easy side branch access, use a provisional or single stent approach, one stent, okay? If side branch access is not easy, you may think about two stents. If the one stent fails and the side branch compromise with an F far less then or equal to 0 0.80, or Timmy blood flows less than three, you think about a two-stent technique. For the complex lesion, you always think about a two-stent approach, and we'll go with that in, in, in a minute. And IVUS OCT imaging is strongly recommended after left main stenting to optimize your result. So stenting techniques that have been validated through trials is a single stent or provisional approach. If you bail out to preserve the patency of left circumflex, you can convert to two-stent technique or dedicated two stent double kiss crush technique we'll talk about in just a minute. These techniques can be performed with our current six French radial axis with six French guides. So the key technique, and I'll not I'll, I'll bore you with some details, but both vessels have to be wired, both the LED and left circumflex. The stent is generally sized with distal reference vessel, which in this case is generally the LED. Part, I'll go through part in just a minute, is essential, and imaging in all cases for stent optimization. So what is POT, a proximal optimization technique? The stent is generally sized to the distal vessel, generally the LED, but it will leave a gap in the left main and there's a gap in the abluminal space. And what you do is you take an oversized balloon to size, size to, the, to the proximal area and you blow that balloon up to, uh, to oppose the stent into the left main uh, uh, very nicely. So this is what we went through, a little algorithm, and 75% of cases are treated with one stent approach. Basically, both vessels are wired, <clears throat> and you put a stent across from the, uh, from the left LED to the left main, and then use the pot, use oversized balloon, to, so, so that the stent is opposed to the left main, and basically, you are done, okay? However, if you're not satisfied with the side branch, you can, you can pull your wire uh, so that the trap wire out and rewire the, through the struts, dilate the struts up, and then end up with a kissing balloon, which balloon the LED in the circ, and f finish with the final pot, and this is the result. Or you can go in and just gently dilate the struts and finish it with a pot technique. So let me show you an example of this, which we did recently. Uh, this is a patient with a distal left main stenosis. Cirque looks okay. Uh, there's no real stenosis in the cirque. And uh, we decided to do a single stent approach in this. We basically we wired the LED in the circumflex. There's a wire in the circumflex, wire in the LED. We ballooned it. And then we put a stent uh, across the... Uh, the uh, uh, LED to the left main. The distant uh, was deployed. And then we blew a uh, larger size balloon, a fiber balloon, the left main. And this is the final result, which is, which is uh, very acceptable. There's moderate stenosis and circumference, which are left alone, but this is the result we had. So when do you go to a two stent approach? When, the, when you feel that the angiographic result is not good, or if you have timiflow less than three, or 
we have f of r less than quad 80. Uh, this is uh, what we do in that case is again, we uh, deploy a stent from the LED to the left main. We blow a large size balloon up to optimize the stent in the left main, but the results are not satisfactory. We pull the jailed wire out, rewire it, and then we put a balloon through and uh, to dilate the struts, and then we put another stent through the, the dilated struts and have minimal protrusion of stents back into the body of left main, blow it up, and this is the results you, you get after putting a second stent if your result is not satisfactory in the side branch. So this is a patient who's 70 with two cancers. He's got multiple myeloma and chemotherapy. He has lung cancer, uh, recently diagnosed two weeks ago. He also has bilateral DVTs. He has an INR 1.92 in warfarin, and he has rest angina. And this is his, his electrocardiogram with having pain uh, in the in intensive care unit. His creatinine is 1.2, platelets are okay. EF is low, EDP is 26, and this is his anatomy. So his uh, left system shows a calcified distal left main chunk, and he's got collaterals to the right, and he's got a occluded uh, CTO. He's got CT on the right coronary artery. So we had a heart team approach. The surgeons would not touch him. We have two ongoing cancers. We asked the oncologist. They said, well, he has life expectancy more than six months. So we proceeded to do this procedure with LV-supported impella. We utilized rotational atherectomy. We were planning a single stent strategy to minimize also the, the duration of his dual antiplate therapy. And we thought of converting him to a two-stent approach if needed. So here is the... Um, his angiogram, you can see the calcified chunk of the distal left main a little clearly. He has the impella catheter to provide support, and we have a temporary pacer since we plan to use rotational atherectomy. So we start with uh, uh, burring through the calcified segment. This was followed by uh, ballooning, and then uh, and this is what the angiographic result was after. You burr through, you can still see some stenosis remaining here, and you can still see that the circumflex has significant stenosis, probably extending 10 millimeters beyond the bifurcation. So we deployed a four millimeter drug drug stent from the uh, left main to the LED. The angiographic result in the side branch was not satisfactory, as you can see, uh, and we decided to put a second stent in the, in the procedure, in the technique I just explained to you. This is the second osteocirc stent, which is in position there. We ended up with kissing balloons, etc., and this is the final result we have. The patient did tolerate uh, DAP for about six months. Uh, he's, he was alive at more than one year, though his clinical course from his cancers has continued to decline. All right, when do we convert to a two stent approach? Um, when you have a complex lesion. And we talked about complex lesion being one with a side branch stenosis equal to greater than 70% or lesion length greater than 10 millimeters or other issues like calcification, thrombus, different angulation, et cetera. That's a dedicated two stent approach. So this approach, the double kiss crush standing approach for two stents, for the intentional two stent technique in complex left main bifurcation, this is getting to be a popular approach validated through clinical trials. And the, whether one or two stents for left main bifurcation PCI is the way to go or not, we'll know the results from double case crush versus provisional, provisional stent of true distal bifurcation lesion in the left main, the DK crush 5 trial, which I was fortunate enough to be part of the writing group, which we presented at TCT 2017 next month and has been accepted for publication in JAK. So whether two stents or one stent are better for complicated stenosis, we wouldn't know that until we have the results of this trial. So this particular technique, I'll just go through that very briefly. Is we first deploy the stent in the side branch, and we intentionally crush the, the struts that are sticking out. So this, that's the first, first crush. And so this is a stem that looks like that after we intentionally crush the stent over here, rewire it, and then we balloon the, arf, the, the open the struts and we end with the first kissing balloon. After that, we deploy a stent again from the LED to the left main. And after we deploy the stent, we do a proximal optimization to optimize the stent stress against the left main. And this is what it looks like after that. We intentionally rewire both of them. Again, do a kissing balloon inflation. And again, go with the part with an oversized balloon uh, to again optimize the stent results. And this is what it looks like. So I'll sh show you an example of this. This is a, a female age 60 with a creatinine of nine. Prior stents with mid-LED and mid-left circumflex. Rest angina, CCS class four. 
She has calcified coronaries with, with uh, non-obstructive CAD in the right coronary artery, normal EF, and the surgeon felt she was cabbage ineligible primarily due to high creatinine level. So this is her uh, anatomy. She has a hazy calcified osteo lesion, and not only that, she has a lesion in the proximal LED over here. She has a very tight osteal left circumflex stenosis here. She has a patent stent in the, in the left circumflex mid portion and a stent in the LED over here. Part of the stent is restenosed in the, in the proximal segment of the LED. So what we did first, we, we put a stent in, uh, in, the, in the osteum of the circumflex and then we intentionally crushed it with a balloon. The next thing we did was we rewired through the stent struts and then we, we did a balloon dilatation of the osteum with the circ again. We did a kissing balloon, initial kissing balloon, followed by stenting from the, uh, from the proximal end uh, area of the LED stenosis out in the left main. We did a proximal optimization with a large balloon. Again, rewired both, did a kissing balloon, ended with the final part, and this is the result we have from where we started. And just to compare the two, All right, uh, the other uh, sort of cases we might get is uh, patients who have had recent surgery. This, this is very rare. So we had a patient with graft failure, a 45-year-old male with recent MI and cardiac arrest. Uh, during the induction phase, uh, during the operation, it, required, it was a very um, uh, chaotic uh, 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 presentation, the OR. We underwent uh, cabbage dance 4 for severe left main proximal right coronary artery stenosis. Uh, he was admitted with a non STEMI three months uh, after bypass surgery. So what you see over here is that the lima is atretic to the LED. The, the saffron vein vigraft that goes to a, to, a, to, a, to a marginal and a, and a ramus. And if you look carefully, there may be a little ulcer sitting in this graft here. And in another view, what he had, and you've got to look at it very carefully, you've got real stenosis of the ostium of that great vein graft, Y vein graft. Um, he had a patent uh, vein graft to small right coronary artery. And his native coronary disease is what we had. A subtotal left main, barely from the LED in the left circumflex. Uh, we went ahead and did a balloon just to establish flow. And this is what we did. We established flow with the balloon inflation. I went through the technique of DK crush that I just explained to you. And this is the final result that we had after the DK crush technique establishing flow in the circ and the LED. So key points in DK crush, and this, I know this is a technical one. We always have to recross the stents proximally. We use two stents, two kissing balloon inflations, and two proximal optimization techniques. What about trifurcations? So this is a 45-year-old male with unstable angina randomizing the Excel trial to stenting. And as he's got distal left main, involving the osteo of the LED, ramus, and the, and the circumflex. In these cases, we try to use just a single stent uh, from the LED to the left main. And then we ended up with what's known as trissing, three balloons, one in the LED, one in the ramus, one in the circ, with known as trissing balloon inflations, and this is the final result. You see that the ramus may be pinched a little, uh, but the stent is, it looks good towards the LED, and the origin of the circ looks good. He came back two years later as a follow-up, and this is what his angiogram looked like. He has some instant restenosis of the ostium of the LED, and the ostium of this, uh, and he's got restenosis of the ostium of the circ. Ramos does not look too bad. We did an FFR, and all three vessels was 1.0. So we basically felt he did well. So intravascular imaging to optimize left main stenting is extremely important. Uh, these are the results uh, at uh, two years that those who had an under-expanded uh, 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 stent had a poor outcome in terms of even free survival versus those who had expanded stent by IVUS. And at, at, uh, at three years, again, the clinical outcomes, those who used IVUS guided had lower outcomes versus those who did not have IVUS guidance. So IVUS guidance is very, very important. I'm sorry, the slide does not project very well. So the important uh, criteria that we need from IVUS guidance is that we should try to achieve a diameter of 8 millimeters square in the body and shaft, 
seven millimeters at the confluence, six millimeters at the LD ostium, and five millimeters at the ostium with circoflex. During recent data from the Excel study, where the 80% IVUS use, the mean stent areas at 12.5 millimeters square had the best outcomes. So the bigger, the better as you proceed through your imaging, and imaging has to be done at the end of these procedures. What about osteal LED and osteal left circumflex stenosis? For osteal LED, a single crossover stent from the left main to the LED is recommended, followed by pot. For osteal circumflex, it's better to do a two stent strategy. What about hybrid coronary revascularization? So, minimally invasive robotic endoscopic atraumatic coronary artery bypass surgery with lima to the LED with less invasive option of PCI and non LED targets with DES is actually, we wouldn't say our invention, was something we, we thought of a long time ago published this paper in 2012, specifically for the left main, hybrid coronary revascularization for treatment of left main coronary stenosis. We had 22 patients who underwent hybrid coronary revascularization. We had no major adverse events at 30 days or three years. So this is a 49-year uh, female with a diabetic. We actually did this as a live case for TCT in, in 2011. She had a distal left main, and you can see the distal left main stenosis here. Our syntax score actually, since this was the isolated lesion, was very low at 12. We um, offered her a hybrid coronary revascularization, which was the uh, using the Da Vinci robot or uh, harvesting the lima, used a non rib uh, spray trichotomy over here, off pump, direct revision, hand sewn, and anastomosis of the LED, and immediate extubation following the procedure. So we had a left internal mammary artery bypass to the LED. So the patient came back. Uh, uh, 72 hours later, her lima to the LED was patent. And uh, uh, we did a, a stent uh, from the left main to the circ, so the circ was unprotected. And this was the angiogram that we did post uh, uh, triggering stent to the circ. The ostium of the uh, LED is obviously pinched, but that's okay since you have lima downstream. And these are the final angiograms. So this is another option, because why Lima to the LED? Because we have the best results from a Lima to the LED that at least the, there's, the patency of the Lima uh, is good up to 20 years. So this uh, is what the post-op scars look, uh, look like. And we, this, is a, this is a segue to the hybrid coronary vasculation trial. We're gonna start soon, in conjunction with Columbia and Mount Sinai. Again, the same principles to evaluate the safety and comparative effectiveness of HCR compared to multivessel PCR with drug stents in patients with multivessel coronary disease involving the left anti descending artery of the left main. And uh, over 2,000 patients will be randomized. One group will get hybrid coronary revascularization of the lima to the LED and PCI of non LED vessels. And the other group will get multivessel PCI with DS, including LED. And this will look at the five year outcomes of MACE, including mort all cause mortality, myocardial fraction, stroke and repeated revascularization over a five-year period. So that's all I have to say as far as an update to left main interventions. In 2017, on the 40th anniversary of PTCA, we can conclude the left main PCI is an acceptable alternative to cabbage, the gold standard. Uh, PCI and cabbage show comparable safety in patients with left main coronary artery stenosis, in patients low to intermediate complexity coronary lesions. How repeat more revascularization is more common after PCI particularly the osteo left circumflex, and how we treat that and what the outcomes are may be shown in the DK Crush 5 trial results which come out at the end of October. Thank you. Thanks, Dan Veer. We'll start with some questions. I'll start you off with, so um, given the complexity of this, are there any differences in the recommendations for antiplatelet therapy in these patients for follow-up? So in th these trials, all these patients got dual antiplatelet therapy for one year. And uh, I, I like to continue, and those are low bleeding risks per the recommendation of the, of the, of, of the DAPT, uh, per the DAPT recommendations indefinitely if possible. So uh, Dan, very, very, that was excellent. Uh, one of the questions that comes up about Contrasting the two most recent trials, XL and Noble, uh, a lot's been written about how these differ and which one is right. You know, is it uh, the two? Uh, 
it's a difference. The things that have been postulated for a difference are different stents are used in each one, uh, different uh, follow-up time, and perhaps the uh, even though the syntax score is the same, the thing that drove it was infarction. And the question is, uh, you know, you have to assume that most infarctions with left main stenting are somewhere else. I mean, if you if you really close down your left main, you probably have more than an infarction. But uh, so the so which which of these do you think? First of all, there is a difference in these two trials, and and how do you explain? How do you what weight do you give to each of those three explanations? So yes, the portion at least twenty percent of these patients had different uh, stent designs. Um, the follow up did not include evaluation of troponins in all patients. Okay immediately post-procedure. And the um, outcomes, as you know, people talk about waiting for the XL results uh, at the fifth year. But if you look at the recent meta-analysis of, of all these trials and 4,000 patients, you know, the divergence is not that great right now, but you won't know till, till two years from now what, if there's a true divergence or not. Yeah, those are uh, great points and really nice talk. Uh, well done. Um, so uh, to, to those points, because ultimately, where are we in 2017? So if a patient presents with STEMI, cardiogenic shock, uh, certainly if we have time and the left main's involved, um, you know, reaching out to the surgeons is great. If, if time is of the essence, as it usually is, then we proceed with percutaneous interventions. But in the more elective setting, um, how does the heart team, how do we make the heart team more of a reality, right? I mean, we all talk about the heart team um, and, and is it really a two-way street? So the surgeons get referred patients with left main and maybe lower syntax score and we get referred patients. What recommendations or suggestions do you have to make this heart team approach, which now, by the way, is a class one recommendation, um, a reality? So, you know, guidelines from both ESC and ACC, so you must have a heart team approach. And I take people off the table, and, you know, you have to, at least in elective cases, independently have the surgeon talk to the patient and us talk to the patient so that the patient can make a conclusive argument or come to a conclusion about which way he wants to go. The surgeons generally have, for osteal and shaft left main, tended to refer those patients to us because they may have graft failure down the line, in, particularly in the venous graft uh, for osteal shaft stenosis. But they have generally uh, said, you know, if the osteal shaft, go ahead and fix it because the TLR, TLR rates are so low. But I think the more complex disease, I think, is very important. I, I actually involve the surgeon in every case I do for left unless somebody's in shock, and I think that's the way to go. Does it answer your beef? I mean, well, it, it kind of does. I mean, I, I think if you go around the world um, and you talk to other groups and people, I think what a real heart team approach is not necessarily that each of you talk individually to the patient, but that you know we sit together, review the films together, and first of all come to consensus that is this truly an equipoise patient, right? Because sometimes you might say, well, you know what. PCI is a better option for this patient because they're higher stroke risk, et cetera, or cabbage is a better option. And then to potentially go to the patient together after that review has been done. And there are groups that will spend time like we do in our huddle in the mornings, and they actually stack all their complex decision-making patients, and they review it with the surgeons and then approach. And I think that's what I, where I'd like us to sure. move towards. Uh, because I think that will then, and of course, involving the patient's cardiologist is critical because they may have insights that um, that we don't have in these elective patients. Um, but I also think, from a technique standpoint, here, you know, we're trying to often, um, you know, put a round peg in a square hole, right? We've got these stents that are really designed for, you know, non bifurcation lesions. And yet, we, we try to find ways to make these bifurcation lesions work. As you know, and you described beautifully, the more complex your bifurcation lesions, the worse your outcome with stenting. So my question to you is, where are we with dedicated bifurcation stents? And do you think that would um, 
enhance the results of more complex uh, revascularization with PCI. So as you know, different companies come up with different bifurcation stent designs, but the results have really not panned out to be useful. Uh, part of that is the technical difficulty in delivering those stents and the results from what is known as the Triton trial, for example, uh, where, where really those the results are not that great and they're not tested in the left main scenario. So in terms of dedicated stents, I don't think we'll have that in the left main territory. I think people improve on the techniques and certainly the results of the trials that come out will show it's really the technique that matters more than the kind of stent that you're going to place, in my opinion. All right, Robert. Dr. Dr. Guyton has a comment for you. I uh, agree. I did state that uh, through that. Oh, so Dr. Guyton says the final conclusion needs to include the statement that this is for patients low to intermediate syntax scores. I agree. I think I, that was themed throughout the presentation that these were for low to intermediate scores. Got it. I was just wondering if you think that um, this may sort of shift the paradigm for, again, low and intermediate risk patients and especially our younger patients, whereas thus far we think go to cabbage and if there's an issue with cabbage or cabbage fails down the road, then we do PCI. But now that our patients live longer, they're healthier. You know, just the other day we referred an 87-year-old for, for bypass surgery and um, he's still a surgical candidate, I wonder if in the low and intermediate risk patients going the PCI route first and if that leads to repeated revascularization, then quote unquote saving the cabbage for later, if you know. The so that's the argument that we made. So the Excel trial proponents have said that, hey, um, the, the, the Coupeau is uh, go ahead at least with the first revascularization strategy being a stent and down the line it doesn't work, you have that option of turning over because the mortality risk from the procedure is low, and the patient will declare themselves down the line. And, the, and so the outcomes in 30 days and, 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 and five years is what we really need to know, and the 30 days outcomes are pretty good. I, mean, I think the other really hot item of discussion that, Spencer, you were kind of alluding to as well is this idea of a hierarchical, hierarchical endpoint, right? Oftentimes we say, well, the MACE rates were higher, and, and we know that there's tremendous difference between death, MI, and revascularization. Um, if, if you look at the, the Noble study, maybe you want to comment on this, right? Because remember, the Noble study was a European study that demonstrated that bypass was better than PCI at five years. And do you want to talk about what drove the outcomes of the improved uh, with, with bypass surgery? Was it death and MI or was it revascularization at five it, it years? Was, it was, it was at, uh, unfortunately, the PCI arm, there was most, more MI and surprisingly more strokes. And that cannot be explained why they had more strokes in the PCI arm. Yeah. But my colon fraction and strokes with two, two driving features, not so much DLR. So the, the other question that comes up, everyone says, gosh, we've got to wait for the five-year data of the Excel trial. Mm -hmm. Because remember, the Excel trial was the largest trial. It was larger than Noble. Um, it was very, very carefully done with you know, a lot of intravascular ultrasound use, and the bypass was also very carefully done. So the question is, what can we postulate a catch-up phenomenon would be for the PCI arm between years three and five? Is it restenosis between years three and five? Is it late stent thrombosis between years three and five? Can one surmise that? Or is it neoatherosclerosis? Or indeed, is it you know, patients that haven't been fully revascularized and their downstream lesions from where you performed your PCI that cause event rates? Any discussion about that? Uh, maybe, Spencer, you might have some thoughts. Let Dr. King answer that. So, I mean, I don't know. I mean, we don't know, but I think they're seeing some divergence right now between PCI and cabbage. But the meta-analysis that we had, again, they looked at 4,000 patients from all these four trials and then came to one conclusion that there's an equipoise at five years. But that was a meta-analysis as currently, okay? But that was out of all these 4,000 patients, these four, four different trials. So, so they say it's still about the same in low to intermediate risk group. But if the divergence occurs, I mean, we'll see that in two years, but 
I think it would be maybe new atherosclerosis or, or it may be new, uh, it may be lesions to other sites. But I doubt the left main stent, five years down the line with thrombose or have so much new atherosclerosis to cause, cause issues. Robert, go ahead. Yes, this, this is a great presentation, Ted Beard. I think this is a great presentation. You, you might have to uh, get out of the room there if you don't have feedback. Yeah, there, there's a delay. Anyway, this is a great presentation, Trent and Beer. Robert, you probably have to step out of the room there because of the delay and the feedback. All right. This ex this extends the left main uh, stenting, the uh, left main stenting to bifurcation lesions, which was done in Excel and Noble. The important uh, point, though, is that Excel was driven mainly by periprocedural MIs in the cabbage group, uh, with a very uh, uh, PCI friendly definition of periprocedural MI, and the landmark uh, 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 analysis. Uh, between 30 days and three years shows a superiority of cabbage in the uh, uh, cabbage group, even in these low and intermediate patients, which is why the five-year results are going to be very interesting. Agree. agree. Thank you. <laughs> can we, can any I, comments on diabe diabetic patients? No, the di diabetes did not have any impact on the outcomes of Excel. Uh, we're talking a lot about whether to choose surgery or PCI. Let me take it back a step and ask you what you do with patients who are identified with left main disease. They're not terribly symptomatic. And the left main is there. It's clear. Uh, what uh, criteria do you use to decide whether the patient needs revascularization or not? Say it looks like a 50% left main. Uh, do you use IVUS? Do you use... Uh, FFR, and in case what criteria to use? So, you know, if the, as I said, in terms of criteria of the angiographic stenosis, more than 70%. As you know, IVUS has had some questions because the Korean group said you need a MLA less than 4.8, and the criteria for trials were the MLA less than 6. I think FFR is a better option in terms of, uh, of estimating the physiologic impact of the stenosis, and I think I'd go with the F physiology. I guess. I guess Spencer is asking kind of that upstream question. You've got someone with stable ischemic heart disease. You know, they may or may not have symptoms. Um, they may or may not have ischemia on nuclear testing. H how do you integrate all of that into your decision making? Or do you believe that because of the strategic location of the left main, the amount of myocardium it subtends, one has to be more aggressive with revascular. What is your take on I would, that? I would be more aggressive, number one, because the mortality rate for untreated left main, as you know, is pretty high in a year and two years. So I would probably offer them physiology and then and make sure there's, the, the ischemic burden is there to intervene. So, so this, is, this, is, this comes up, and it, it's kind of interesting, because you know, obviously when we talk about mortality with untreated moderate left mains, we're talking about really old studies, right? The CAS study, the European Cooperative Study, et cetera. And medical therapy has also undergone a revolution, right? I mean, not just with DAP and the usual stuff, but with the new antiatherosclerotic therapies. So um, how do you factor that in? And um, do you go back and exercise all these patients and look at exercise tolerance? Do you look at the amount of ischemia? Um, I know the ischemia trial that's currently ongoing um, is doing a CT angiogram to actually exclude patients with left that's main right. disease. But it, I think that's an interesting conversation. Yeah, I mean, you can take the appropriate use criteria and justify almost anything now. But so, so I've got left main disease. Say I got 50%. I'm feeling okay. Put me on a treadmill. I get stage three, but I've got, you know, a millimeter ST depression or something. And so the question. So then I get a cath, and the cath shows uh, FFR of uh, uh, eight five, and it shows uh, you do IVUS, and it comes out at eight or whatever. Eight, 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 eight millimeters. Leave it alone. <laughs> yeah, I mean that's the question. I mean, if you take the position that left main is bad and can cause trouble. I don't think we can depend on the old data that says that mortality, what the, we haven't a clue what the mortality is in the patient I'm describing to you. So, uh, 
yeah, if it, if it gets worse, they're done for. But I bet there are a lot of people just treating those patients uh, on the strength of uh, left main's bad. It's got the word left main. But, but it's just not just left, <laughs> left main. But, but, it's, it's, but, <laughs> but exactly that patient will not do well to bypass and its grass might deteriorate. Well, yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm just that's making a point. It may be somebody you leave alone, but now it takes more guts to leave it alone than it does to do something. Okay, well, well thank, with that excellent point, we'll call it quits, but thanks a lot, Tian Beer, and thanks for a great discussion, everyone. The preceding program is copyrighted by Emory University.